Chapter 2 The Plains of Nature In order to enunciate even these broad principles, however, it is necessary to begin by explaining some of the facts discovered by the use of this very faculty. The first point which must be clearly comprehended is the wonderful complexity of the world around us, the fact that it includes enormously more than comes within the range of ordinary vision. We are all aware that matter exists in different conditions, and that it may be made to change its conditions by variation of pressure and temperature. We have the three well-known states of matter, the solid, the liquid and the gaseous, and it is the theory of science that all substances can, under proper variation of temperature and pressure, exist in all these conditions. There are still, I think, a few substances which chemists have not succeeded in reducing from one state to another, but it is universally believed that just as water may become ice at a lower temperature and steam at a higher one, so every solid which we know might become liquid or gaseous under proper conditions. Every liquid may be made solid or gaseous, every gas may be liquefied and even solidified. We know that air itself has been liquefied and that some of the other gases have been reduced to a solid slab. Occult chemistry shows us another and higher condition than the gaseous into which also all substances known to us can be translated or transmuted, and to that condition we have given the name of etheric. That which science postulates as ether is found by occult chemistry to be not a homogeneous body, but simply another state of matter, not itself a new kind of substance, but ordinary matter reduced to a particular state. We may have, for example, hydrogen in an etheric condition instead of as a gas, we may have gold or silver or any other element either as a solid, a liquid or a gas, or in this other higher state which we call etheric. Just as we find in the world about us some elements normally solid, as is gold, some normally liquid, as is mercury, and some normally gaseous, as is oxygen, so there are substances which are normally etheric, which ordinarily exist in that condition, though by special treatment they can be brought down to the gaseous condition, or raised to some other state still finer than their own. In ordinary science we speak of an atom of oxygen, an atom of hydrogen, an atom of any of the 60 or 70 substances which chemists call elements, the theory being that that is an element which cannot be further reduced, and that each of these elements has its atom, and an atom, as we may see from the Greek derivation of the word, means that which cannot be cut or further subdivided. Occult science tells us what many scientists have frequently suspected that all these so-called elements are not in the true sense of the word elements at all, that what we call an atom of oxygen or hydrogen is not the ultimate, and in fact is not an atom at all, but a molecule which can under certain circumstances be broken up into atoms. By repeating this breaking up process, it is found that we arrive eventually at an infinite number of definite physical atoms which are all alike so that there is one substance at the back of all substances, and different combinations of its ultimate atoms give us what in chemistry are called atoms of oxygen or hydrogen, gold or silver, lithium or platinum, etc. When these are all broken up we get back to a set of atoms which are all identical, except that some of them are positive and some negative. The study of these atoms and of the possibilities of their combination is in itself one of most enthralling interest, though foreign to our present subject. But those specially interested in the matter may be referred to Mrs. Besant's article upon occult chemistry for November 1895. Even these, however, are found to be atoms only from the point of view of our physical plane. 
That is to say, there are methods by which even they can be subdivided, but when they are so broken up they give us matter belonging to a different realm of nature, matter which is not expansible by any degree of heat which we are able to produce, or contractible by any degree of cold with which we are acquainted. Yet this higher matter also is not simple but complex, and we find that it also exists in a series of states of its own, corresponding very fairly to the states of physical matter which we call solid, liquid, gaseous, or etheric. Again, by carrying on our process of subdivision far enough we reach another atom, the atom of that realm of nature to which occultists have given the name of the astral world. Then the whole process may be repeated, for by further subdivision of that astral atom we find ourselves dealing with another still higher and more refined world, though a world which is still material. Once again we find matter existing in definitely marked conditions corresponding at that much higher level to the states with which we are familiar. And the ultimate result of our investigations brings us once again to an atom, the atom of this third great realm of nature, which in theosophy we call the mental world. So far as we know, there is no limit to this possibility of subdivision, but there is a very distinct limit to our capability of observing it. However, we can see enough to be certain of the existence of a considerable number of these different realms, each of which is in one sense a world in itself, though in another and wider sense all are parts of one stupendous whole. In our literature these different realms of nature are frequently spoken of as planes, because in our study it is sometimes convenient to image them as one above another, according to the different degrees of density of the matter of which they are composed. It will be seen that in the accompanying diagram, they are drawn in this way, but it must be very carefully borne in mind that this arrangement is merely adopted for convenience and as a symbol, and that it in no way represents the actual relations of these various planes. They must not be imagined as lying above one another like the shells of a bookcase, but rather as filling the same space and interpenetrating one another. It is a fact well known to science that even in the hardest substances no two atoms ever touch one another. Always each atom has its field of action and vibration, and every molecule in turn has its larger field, so that there is always space between them under any possible circumstances. Every physical atom is floating in an astral sea, a sea of astral matter which surrounds it and fills every interstice in this physical matter. It is universally recognized that ether interpenetrates all known substances, the densest solid as well as the most rarefied gas, and just as it moves with perfect freedom between the particles of the denser matter, so does astral matter interpenetrate it in turn and move with perfect freedom among its particles. The mental matter in its turn interpenetrates the astral in precisely the same manner. So that all these different realms of nature are not in any way separated in space, but are all existing around us and about us here and now, so that to see them and to investigate them it is not necessary for us to make any movement in space but only to open within ourselves the senses by means of which they can be perceived.